Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and his risen Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We are told in God's word that as we gather together, we are to remember these lessons. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison, and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. So we gather together to be in the presence of Jesus. And Jesus tells us if we receive those who are the least among us, we receive Jesus. We receive God. And God receives us. So let us enter the presence of our Lord as we prepare to continue our worship. And this uh, hymn that we are about to sing, This Is My Father's World, is one that, uh, not planning my funeral, but when I do plan my funeral, I'm going to keep this one because of this uh, last verse. And I hope when we sing it, it will be especially uh, uh, growing in your heart as well. This is my Father's world. Oh, let me never forget that though the wrong, though the wrong seems off so strong, and isn't that our world today? Though the wrong seems off so strong, God is the ruler yet. That's the promise that we come to celebrate. This is my Father's world. And I love this. The battle is not done. We are in the midst of spiritual warfare. The battle is not done. But Jesus, who died, will be satisfied. And earth and heaven will be one. I can't wait for that day. Praise the Lord together. Save me, O God, by your name, vindicate me by your might. Hear my prayer, O God, listen to the words of my mouth. Arrogant foes are attacking me, ruthless people are trying to kill me, people without regard for God. Surely God is my help, the Lord is the one who sustains me. 
Let evil recoil on those who slander me, and your faithfulness destroy them. I will sacrifice a free will offering to you. I will praise your name, Lord, for it is good. You have delivered me from all my troubles, and my eyes have looked in triumph on my foes. Amen. The God who gives us this promise and his Son bring you peace. And so this day, may the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be and abide with each of you. Please greet your neighbor in the name of our Lord. children. Amen. We invite the children to come forward at this time.
right. Well, let's see. Today we have to uh, count off how many children we have here. How are you? Good. Have a seat. Come on in. The water's fine. There you go. Ooh, who do you have with you today? Is that Mickey? Wow. And you have glasses? Wow, was it your birthday? <laughs> oh, those are your glasses? Oh, oh, they look, oh, those are very nice on you. You look like a movie star. No? Okay. Well, how many children do we have here? We have to count off. Hey, Brewer. One, two, three, four, five. We'll count you two. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11, 12. Okay. Now, we're going to ask for some helpers today, okay? <clears throat> I need 12 adults. I need 12 adults to help with the children's message. You don't have to do anything other than stand over there right now. So I need 12 adults. By the time I'm done talking to the children, we need 12 adults standing over there. So Okay, here you go. Twelve adults standing right over there, right between the pillar and the door. Okay, so do you know, do you know who's very special to Jesus? Who do you think, who do you think Jesus' like favorite person in the world is? Who do you think it is? Us? Like who? Like who's us? The people of God, yeah. But he likes, uh, um, let's see, do you think he likes Mitch? Yeah? Okay. So, but who do you think, like, who's this? How are you? Who do you think? Do you think Jesus, do you think he's Jesus' favorite person? Huh? Brody? Do you think he is? Uh, let's see, uh, Anthony, do you think you're Jesus' favorite person in all the world? Yes, that's the right answer. You are. Isn't that great? Yeah, it should make us all want to smile. So do you know what Jesus says is that if we love the little children as much as else in the world as if they're the most special person in the world now come here you want to sit next to mickey this is an old trick that grandpa bill learned <laughs> so what jesus did he didn't have mickey mouse to use oh you're coming over too okay that's good but he said jesus took little children in his arms and he said jesus loves you. But when Jesus said it, it was Jesus saying, Jesus loves you. But I'm not Jesus, but I'm telling you what Jesus would say if he were here, Jesus loves you. Now, you see those 12 people over there? Do you know who they are? Who are they? They're people, but who are they for right now? Who? There are 13 people? Okay, one of you has to go twice. <laughs> Nobody said they could count. There are more. We have more than we need. That's a great thing. At Hope Church, we always have more than we need. All right, but who are they? Who is that? Who are those people over there? Do you know who they are? Jesus isn't here because Jesus is in heaven. So who are those people? They are... Who? Jesus, you're right. They are Jesus. They are go here. The 13th person gets to welcome Mickey. <laughs> okay, because what they're going to do is they're going to get to do something that Jesus says each of us can do. Jesus says, if you will receive these children, then you are receiving me. And if you receive me, you receive God who is in heaven. So what they're going to do, as you go to children in worship or back to your seats, you go up there, and one of them 
is going to take each of you and give you a little hug and say, Jesus loves you. Amen. All right, so one at a time. Here you go on your way to children's worship, and each adult gets to receive God. Here we go. All right. Go hug Jesus. Thanks, Anthony. Good job. Go hug Jesus. Okay, we're done. You get to follow you get to follow them. Okay? You go to children and worship. All right. Bye. Bye, Mickey. Bye, Minnie. I'm not Minnie. Oh, you're not Minnie? Yeah. Okay, okay. Bye. Each week in worship, we call upon the name of the Lord to hear the confession of our sin. It's sort of a hard thing for us to do as human beings, to acknowledge that we are sinful people, that we need to be forgiven. It's, it's hard for us to say, Jesus, forgive me, because we think, well, if I just try harder next time, it'll be all right. If I just work a little harder, then God will love me. But that's not how it works at all. How it works is very simply this. Jesus says, you come into my arms, and you ask me to forgive you, and before the words are out of your mouth, before the breath has passed your lips, your sins are forgiven. And then Jesus says to you, Jesus loves you. 
So call upon the name of the Lord, friends, and be saved. Is there any greater reason to worship, to come into the presence of the Lord, to worship our Lord? Your sins are forgiven. Jesus loves you. Amen. Well, this morning it is my great pleasure to uh, introduce you to someone who has become a new friend of mine, Pastor Angel Pagan. And uh, Pastor Pagan uh, is here to worship with us today for a very special reason, and we're going to uh, let you know about that as uh, I introduce you to Pastor Pagan. So, Pastor, if you'd come forward, I'll give you Jill's microphone and... Uh, Say greetings on behalf of the people of Hope Church to you. We're glad you're here. And tell us a little bit about yourself and your family, Pastor. Sure. Uh, God bless everyone. Uh, I'm very humble and blessed to be here this morning. Uh, I feel the joy and the love and the kindness. I've never been to a particular service uh, in the American form. Uh, so I'm being blessed today, believe it or not. And I, I thank the pastor with humbleness and open arms how he has received me. Uh, as he was saying, I'm Pastor Pagan, pastor in the ministry for 18 years. We started in 1995 as Voice of Alert Ministries in the state of Pennsylvania. And throughout the years, uh, me and my wife, who've been together, married for 25 years, father of six, three girls, three boys, and already 13 grandchildren. <laughs> uh, so I am enjoying as I see the children praising God and how beautiful it is that the Church of Christ can come together and praise his name. Uh, my goal is to continue preaching the word of God. I ended up uh, here in Wisconsin helping a pastor uh, who was trying to recover in the Semini Church 10th and High. And uh, after uh, continuing to be ill, uh, another pastor was established here. So my job was I was done there. I've also done chaplain work in East Camden, New Jersey, uh, helping in the prisons and helping those that are in need. And that is my goal uh, today as we speak, to continue uh, introducing this ministry, helping those that are in need. Uh, at the mo at mo moment in time, uh, we had a particular place where we held our services, but according to uh, certain regulations, we were not able to continue uh, at that particular facility. And that's how I came about uh, when I knew Pastor Rick Across from here. At the uh, Methodist Church, Methodist Pastor Rick. Church, yep. Pastor Rick introduced me uh, to Pastor Rink, and uh, that's how I became about uh, this day today. So you are pastor of a congregation known as Iglesia Impacto y Liberación. Impact. How did I do? That's right, Impact and Liberation. Okay, Impact and Liberation. And uh, tell us why, what's the meaning of that um, uh, name for your congregation? Why that name? Well, if, if you give me a moment, I'll tell you why. The Lord, the Lord, uh, the Lord put it in my heart, kind of uh, explains the reason. Uh, in other words, uh, I don't know if you remember the passage of the, the Samaritan woman. At a particular time, uh, she went to draw water. The Bible says that she was despised, rejected, 
And in many, says the Bible that call having the love of Christ, the Bible says that no Jewish person will be found to go near her or speak to her in public because of her circumstances. But she was in sin, and Jesus was there because he came to let the captive free. And that's where it came about, impact and liberation. Uh, it says in Luke uh, chapter 14, or chapter 4, verse 18, verse 19, the spirit of the Lord is, in, is on me because has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of the sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And as I say that, uh, I like the fact that Jesus broke the barriers. Proclaiming the good news is for everyone, no matter what race or gender or any social po position, reputation, so we may have in the secular world. It's about Jesus. It's about doing our work as he called us to do, to be one in God. Like in the uh, book of Psalm, chapter 133, verse 1, how good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. And that is my goal. I wish that uh, multicultural uh, many can come to the Lord and unite together. That's what Jesus called us to do, to reach out the lost and that's how it became impact and liberation. Jesus came to free the captive. Time was running short. The students just were not getting it. In fact, it seemed that the Gentiles, the very people Jesus thought he was not yet to worry about reaching, understood more about it than his chosen people. The secret mission was no longer a secret to the Gentiles, nor to Jesus. Jesus came to save everyone who would believe in him. Jesus' secret identity was no longer a secret either because people were discovering that he was in fact the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one sent by God to turn the world value system upside down by grace and mercy. It wasn't any more good enough to be a secret disciple of Jesus if the kingdom was to grow. But the 12 men Jesus had chosen to be his message bearers just were not getting it. So he took them on a long walk through the back roads, over some hills, down into some valleys. He didn't want anyone to know where they were. Here again, the, the secret mission. Jesus didn't want there to be anyone else around. No distractions. Turn off your cell phones. Put all of your electronic devices away so you can listen to what I'm about to tell you. Time was running short. He had to get the message across. And so today we learn, and then next week we'll learn the rest, but today we learn the first of these lessons. Secret lesson number one. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. The lesson seems pretty simple, doesn't it? But of course, if you were hearing it, before history had unfolded, it would be pretty incomprehensible. It would be like calculus was for me in high school. The teacher might as well have been speaking in Chinese because I had no idea what we were talking about. So he would finish his lecture and he would say to the class, any questions? Well, now as you might imagine, I was not a quiet person in high school. I probably drove the other kids crazy because I was one of those students who just would not shut up. I could almost feel their eyes behind me rolling. There he goes again. I admit it. I like to hear myself talk too much from my childhood on, but not in calculus class. I had nothing to ask because I was afraid that if I asked a question, it would reveal that I had no clue 
what in the world we'd been talking about for 40 minutes or 40 days or 40 weeks. The problem was, you see, I had no frame of reference in my mind to understand the words. Well, it's not actually quite true. I understood the words because the teacher did speak in English. And in calculus, you know, you use letters like A and B and X. I know what A and B and X mean, what they are, but I don't know what they mean when you put them in parentheses with equal signs. I knew what the pieces meant, but I didn't get the context. That's what it was like for the disciples when they heard this lesson. Say what? You see, the secret lessons Jesus was teaching were hard for them to comprehend, like that incomprehensible math class. Not because they didn't understand the words. They understood what those words meant. But they didn't understand the context. The words just didn't compute. They maybe understood that Son of Man was Jesus' way of talking about himself. But why did Jesus speak in the third person, right? Why not just say, I? Why not say, when he talks about being delivered into the hands of men, why not just say, Judas, the one sitting third from Jesus to his left around the circle, around the campfire, why not just say, Judas is going to be delivering me into the hands of men? Why not just say, instead of they will kill him, why not just say, I will die on a cross, even though I did nothing wrong, even though I was without sin. This they might understand. But then there's the next part, and after three days he will rise. Even if he had said it more plainly, three days after I'm killed on a cross, I'm going to rise from the dead, I don't think the result would have been any better than the calculus teacher trying to get Billy T to understand how to compute X. You just can't understand what that can mean. Jesus, of course, had a purpose in speaking in the third person. He wanted to connect his role on earth to the prophecies going back into the Jewish scriptures where Daniel and others talk about the Son of Man, talking about the one that would come to be the Savior of the people. He was trying to teach him, Jesus was, that he was the promised one, that the fate the prophets had talked about for the sent one were going to happen just as God had written. And, and here is the news. Those prophecies that you remember, disciples, are about, wait for it, me, Jesus. Any questions? Silence. Dead silence. They were clueless. And they were afraid, the scripture tells us. What did they fear? That what he said was true, maybe. And they didn't want to think about what it would mean for them. Or they were afraid of sounding dumb. What? How about you? Any questions? Now, I have my phone here. Normally I leave it in my study, but I brought it along. Any of you who are tweeters, um, I have my Twitter account up. Uh, you can now uh, tweet to me your questions, and I will uh, look at them. You know, you just send me a message. Uh, there's that little message icon, and I will read your question then uh, to the congregation. Or those of you who don't have your phones turned on, just grab one of those communication cards any questions you have so far, write them down, pass them to the middle, and uh, one of the deacons will be happy to pick them up. So, what questions do you have about secret lesson number one? I'll just wait for the first tweet to pop up here. Okay. Um, cards being passed down. Hmm. Uh, it's at hope underscore Pastor Bill. Maybe I needed to give you that. Okay. 
first question. You can just raise your hand then and ask. Boy, that must have been uncomfortable around the campfire with Jesus, don't you think? How long did he sit there letting them be silent? Silence can be very uncomfortable. You can sort of picture the disciples squirming, shifting their seats in the sand. I can see Peter turning to James, scratching his head. I can see John sort of cracking his knuckles. Oh, long day, almost time to turn in. While Thomas is just wondering, can this be what he really dragged us out here to talk about? By the way, I did not have this sermon written in case somebody did send me a question, so I'm glad you didn't, because I don't know what I would have said. But the point of lesson one is very simple. You cannot understand Jesus, Messiah. You cannot understand who he is unless you talk about both his death and his rising. You need to understand both. Here's the calculus. If A is death, and B is rising, what is X? Salvation. A plus B equals X. Death plus rising equals salvation for you, for me. That's lesson one. But the apostles weren't ready yet to write their creed. You know the one they wrote? Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that he was crucified, died, and buried on the third day. He rose again. Eventually, they got it. But for now, the lesson to them was still a secret. How about you? Is it still a secret? Or is it starting to bubble up? Is it starting to be the way that you want your life to be lived? In the knowledge of this lesson. It doesn't need to be a secret anymore. It's in the most popular book ever sold in the world for everybody to read. And so we have it. But they didn't get it, the disciples, yet. So after Jesus makes his point in lesson one, he says, all right, I'm turning off the computer. Boys, time to turn in. Let's go home. So they head back to the guest house where they're staying. Jesus didn't have a house. You know that, right? Didn't have a job, didn't have a house. So they're going back to this guest house where they're staying that night. And on the way, the disciples are arguing still more among themselves. Not about lesson one. You know, boom, gone. But they keep talking. Jesus is walking ahead of them. And they think he can't hear them. So Jesus is walking ahead, thinking about what's coming. He's on his way to Jerusalem, what it's going to be like, all of these things. And he hears this whispering and the shh. Not so loud in the background. And he just shakes his head as he listens to them. Oh, brother, this is going to be harder than I thought. So they get inside the house. And the family's getting ready for bed. So mom is telling little Joshua, who's running around in this house, go brush your teeth, it's time for bed. And Jesus is sitting down, maybe with a cup of wine, and he asks his students, so what was all of the fuss about on the road? Again. Silence. These secret lessons were not going very well. But this time there's a different reason for their silence, for they were embarrassed. They did not want Jesus to know what they were arguing about when Jesus was the king of Israel. Who they were fighting would be the secretary of state. Who was going to be the secretary of the treasury? Kind of like the workers for the presidential candidates now. No one talks about it in front of the candidate, but after work, they sit around dreaming about who's going to get the desk nearest the Oval Office. Just think what it's going to be like when CNN wants to interview me to ask what the president is planning to do with Social Security. But Jesus knew what they were talking about either by the exercise of his divine knowledge or because some of them just were not very good at whispering. But anyway, Jesus knew. So Jesus calls in little Joshua as he's running away from his mommy. 
And he picks up Joshua and he puts him on his lap, gives him a big bear hug, and he says to him, you know, he's got those big carpenter hands and those strong carpenter arms, gives little Joshua a big bear hug. And he says, good night, Joshua. See you tomorrow. Remember, buddy, Jesus loves you. You see, here's the thing. Jesus says, if you get nothing else, this is what it means to be my disciple. Anyone who wants to be first must be very last and the servant of all. I send you into the world to value the ones the world doesn't care about. Now, you maybe know what this is. Anybody know what this is? A selfie stick, okay? I have a selfie stick. I won't say where I got it. But you put, it, you put this on this thing, and then you hold it out here like this, and then, like, if I have, uh, name a famous actress. Famous actress, any famous, who? Julia Roberts, standing next to me. I'd put my arms around Julia, take my picture, put it on Facebook, and people would say, wow, Bill's friends with Julia Roberts, and that's how it goes, okay? So, you see, what Jesus is saying is the people that you're going to take a selfie with, those aren't the people I'm worried about. The people I'm creating the church for are the people that the world says are little children who we don't even think about. Because in that day, people didn't care about kids at all. Jesus did, but not the world. So, who are the people Jesus would say we ought to take our selfie with? Who are the invisible people that Jesus would say we need to take a picture with to let the world know this is the person I care about? People with a disability. People who are in prison. People who are homeless. People who are hungry people who are without work and desperate for work. You see, if we think about the people that Jesus wants, we're looking to take a selfie, not with Aaron Rodgers as he walks through the mall, but with the person who's sitting there who has no place to go. You see, those are the people that are really important to Jesus, that he wants his disciples to worry about. This little child, this kid was sitting on my lap. The world doesn't even know he exists. And all of the invisible people like him. Disciples need to care about the people the news cameras never shine on, who are not among the rich, not among the famous or the strong, or anyone who thinks that they can save themselves. That's not who we're here to serve. We are here to serve, friends, as disciples, people that the world says are invisible. Don't ask people to serve you. Ask who you can serve, especially the weak, the powerless, society's voiceless, the faceless masses. These are the heroes in the kingdom of Jesus, the one who sees the invisible, the one who takes that invisible person in her, her arms with a big bear hug and says, I see you. You matter to me and to God. Remember, Jesus loves you, friends, and so do I. That's the secret. When you receive these little invisible ones into your arms, you receive Jesus. You receive God. When you welcome the little ones with open arms, you hold Jesus. You hold God in your arms. And you want to know something even better. Jesus hugs you right back. Those scarred carpenter's hands take your hands. Those 
loving hand that never let you go. Amen. Will you join me in prayer? Father, we pray that you will give us hearts with eyes to see the invisible. Give us minds to understand the incomprehensibility of the fact that your death and your rising are our salvation. And give us the courage to stand before the world to the most needy, to the most invisible, and to let them know that just as Jesus saved me, so he wants to save you. And so all the world together says, Jesus is Lord. Amen. Please rise as we proclaim our life in him.